Thanks, Jan. I am so excited to be here. I have been wanting to tell this story <laughs> for the longest time. But the thing about this story is it just keeps going on. In the past, I've come up here and spoken to you, and I've usually woven whatever I have to say into some sort of a theatrical presentation. But tonight, I'm really just here to tell you a story. You know, my theme tonight is dandelions. And when you think of a dandelion here in America, what do you think of? Weeds, that's exactly right. And we spend a lot of effort and time trying to get rid of those pesky things, don't we? Well, in Latvia, it just so happens that they think of dandelions as beautiful flowers. And when we traveled to Latvia, everywhere we looked during the late spring and early summer were gorgeous, yellow, beautiful dandelions. A weed or a flower really is all in your perspective, isn't it? The reason I decided to use the dandelion is partly because of what I learned when I was in Latvia, that it actually is a beautiful flower, but also, you know how when the dandelion goes to seed and you have the little round, I, there's some technical name for that little puff, and the wind comes or a little child comes and goes, and then those seeds go, woo, wherever they go, and then they land somewhere and they take root and up come the dandelions. Well, that's kind of the story of the last three and a half years of our life. We were this and out they went. And we didn't know for sure where it was going to land. As Jan told you, my husband and I uh, were very uh, involved in theater. We've been married almost 32 years. And about 20 years ago, we had decided, you know, we're probably not going to have children, and that's OK for us. We have a lot of interest in our, in our uh, theater careers. This is doing what we love to do. Our job kind of was like our children. And we were absolutely fine with that. And then there was this and out went the seeds. And somebody who used to work here named Ryan Durfee, our former worship pastor, encouraged us to come along on a mission trip to Latvia. Latvia, okay, where's Latvia was my first question. How about you? How's your geography? Mine wasn't so good. And so I go to a map and I'm looking and it's a very small country about the size of West Virginia that snuggled right up to Russia and squeezed between Estonia and Lithuania. And um, so off we went to Latvia. Now, this was our first challenge, was how do we get the money to go to Latvia? It was about, I think, $2,600 we needed to raise in order to, um, to go. And this seemed impossible to us because, as we mentioned, uh, we were theater people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you people with real jobs don't know what I'm talking about. So we had to somehow try and come up with that money. And it was looking pretty bleak for quite a while. And uh, David kept saying, well, maybe we're not supposed to go. But Ryan had this steadfast insistence and faith uh, that we needed to go. And he kept saying, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. And we were all OK. So about a week before time to go, we were still almost $1,000 short of the money that we needed to go. And so we're really wondering what in the world God had in mind for us. Out of the blue, now we had sent out support letters. Out of nowhere, we get a, uh, in an email from some friends of ours who knew we were going, but we hadn't sent a support letter to them, only because we didn't think that would be something they would be very receptive to. They were, weren't really in that place. So um, we get this email that says, uh, I understand, you know, I'm so worried about you going to Latvia, and I just keep thinking you're not going to have the money. And so we'd like to find out how short you are and help you out. So uh, we told them, and they said, OK, here's a check for $2,000. Go, there's your extra 900 that you need, and you'll probably need some stuff before you go, and you'd probably like some spending money. So that was the first in a long line of miracles that began to happen once we uh, made the plans to go to Latvia. Uh, Latvia is a beautiful country. Uh, it is emerald green when you get it's full of forests and great big tall trees. Um, it has, the people there love flowers, they love music. Their language has a real kind of a rhythm to it that's just really pleasant to hear. Uh, David and I absolutely fell in love with Latvia. Just a couple more slides, I think, of Latvia. Oh, yeah, storks. We don't have those here. We were so excited. <laughs> and uh, we found out that storks, now what is it you say, Bible, if you see a stork? Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and what it means is my luck, not your luck, right? So if you see a stork, you're supposed to tag somebody and say my luck, not your luck. 
Um, so anyway, we fell in love with Latvia. What did we do there? Well, we went with the choir, a small group of us, about 20 I think it was, and uh, while we were there we went to our sister church in Talsi and we sang and I spoke a little bit and we also did a, um, a little drama piece there. And on one of the days, we also went to some of the surrounding towns, and on one of the days we went to a, a town called uh, Ventspils. And in that town was an orphanage named Selga. Now, that was a, it was an unusual orphanage because it was a combination between uh, an orphanage and a, kind of a senior home. And we performed for them. And I went in there, I don't know if anyone here has ever visited an orphanage, but um, I went in feeling like, well, I better put my blinders up because I know how I can be. Not that I had adoption in mind at all, but I went in thinking, I need to protect my heart because this is going to be hard to see a building full of children who don't have parents. So I promise you, I went in not thinking about adoption at all. Well, after our concert, we, we did a tour through the orphanage, and um, as we were touring through, I turned to my right, <laughs> this is the part I know I can get through, and there was Baiba. And I saw her sparkly eyes and her little braids, and something happened in my heart that I have difficulty explaining, but it was like an unplanned call to action. I was meeting my daughter for the first time, and I knew it. But I ignored it, <laughs> as, as any <laughs> logical person would. So <laughs> we went ahead and toured through, and then we got on the bus, and um, David turned to me. And oh, I asked, first of all, when we were standing in the orphanage, I, I turned to Baiba, and I asked her her name. And in a little tiny voice, she said, Baiba? And I tell you, that's the last time I ever heard that little tiny voice. <laughs> <laughs> And I, said, I asked her how old she was, and she said 13. And our friend Todd was on the trip, too, and he said, how long have you been here? And she said, 13 years. <laughs> I know, I had the same reaction, and I thought, well, who holds her when she cries? That was my first thought. So we got in the bus, and I could not stop thinking about Baiba. And um, David got in the bus with me, and he sat down, and he said, that girl. And I said, what girl? You mean Baiba? And he said, yeah. I said, I can't get her off my mind. I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, during our concert, I saw her in the front row, and it was like there was some sort of a light around her. He said, I could not get my eyes off of her. And I think that's our next slide, if we go to that. There she is. <laughs> Somebody in our group took that picture, and um, he said there was something about her. He just could not keep his eyes off of her. And I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> but I didn't say anything more, because I knew we were <laughs> never going to be in that place ever. So I dropped it. And um, then David brought it up probably about oh, five more times over the coming days. And finally, I said, should we be? Yeah, well, no, first of all, I forgot a part of the story, the important part, real important part, sitting right here. <laughs> so he ran off the bus and took a picture. And he came back on, and he said, well, I understand that she has a sister. So now we were going, OK, so there's two of them. <laughs> yes, all right. So now, now, a few days pass, and he keeps bringing it up and bringing it up. And finally, I said, should we be talking about adopting them? And he said, like, you finally got that hint. He said, yeah. <laughs> So, so we checked into it and we found out that they were available for adoption and that the, probably the best way for us to proceed was to host them, first of all. Uh, and there's an organization called New Horizons for Children, which is a wonderful organization for hosting uh, children from Latvia and Ukraine and Russia. And they come for five weeks, either over the summer or uh, during Christmas, and they uh, spend time with your family and see how you, they do in America. And, uh, and so that's what we decided to do. So this was all in 2009. The summer of 2009 is when we saw the girls. And then Christmas of 2009, suddenly they were, they were at our house spending Christmas with us. Well, <laughs> we picked them up at the airport. And um, they, I can't even imagine what it was like for them to arrive in America, have these people they really didn't remember at all who were saying, come on. And, you know, come stay with us. So they came back to our house, and they knew very little English. They knew some. Agnesa was more willing to speak than Baiba was at first. And uh, so she was kind of helping with uh, our getting them situated in the house and everything. And Baiba arrived sick, and so she, I could tell she didn't feel well, and she kind of told me that, too. And I put my hand out like this, and she stuck her little forehead out, and I checked, and sure enough, she had a fever. And I thought, oh, good, I get to mother her right away. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I got a thermometer, you know, we took her temperature and it was about 100 and her eyes got as big as saucers because they're Celsius over there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So <laughs> Agnesa quickly reassured her, no, 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 it's different, it's different, it's different. We toured them through the house and I could tell they were, they were speaking Latvian the whole time, but I could tell they were very excited to have a bathroom all to themselves. It was like, they walk into the bathroom, <laughs> that's a happy thing. So, um, and then they, their English started to improve and improve as we spent this time together. And finally, Baiba just started talking quite a bit. And we said, wow, your English is really good. And she goes, well, I do English. I just didn't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> she just didn't feel confident right at the first. So that was fine. We did a whole bunch of great activities with them. They got to know our two dogs, Brady and Sydney. We spent lots of time with family. Um, we went shopping, which if you ask them, what did we do? That's what they'll tell you. <laughs> shopping we went shopping that was their favorite thing we decorated for Christmas we celebrated both of their birthdays which had already passed uh, they had just turned uh, well Bibas was just a couple days before she came and she had just turned 14 and Agnesa had turned 16 before they came we discovered that Agnesa seemed to be a very stoic steady mature and introverted girl and Baiba was sort of young playful spirited and extroverted so they were as different as night and day and this is the truth to this day they're very different I have this theory that uh, in life that everybody's either a cat or a puppy or a puppy cat <laughs> and if you want to know pure cat that's Agnesa our oldest and pure puppy is <laughs> our youngest I told that theory to somebody once and they said yeah I told my sister about that and she said she thought it was the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard and I said oh, she's a cat right <laughs> You know, I, I, I have to tell you, the strangest thing about adoption is that you love them before you ever get to know them. Would you raise your hand if you happen to be an adoptive parent in here? Do we have a few? Okay. All right. It's weird, isn't it? It's just like this strange provision that God provides. He gives you that it's like, I love them. I love them. What? Oh, yes, she, she knitted little booties for our poor brain. <laughs> I loved them before they ever arrived, and when they came and they stayed with us, it just confirmed the fact that I loved them so much. We had gotten permission, normally this is not uh, permissible when you host, but we wanted to ask them if they would be interested in being adopted. We couldn't imagine, actually my mom who's sitting down here said, you have got to tell them your plans are to adopt them, how can you send them back without them knowing? And so we got permission to talk to them, and one, uh, one evening we sat around the table and um, David presented to them that we wanted to be a forever family with them. Well, that was a very emotional time, obviously, and we all began to cry a little bit, and heads were shaking, yes, yes, we want to come. And then Baiba said, Madara. <laughs> said, Madara, yes, that's our sister. And uh, we had heard of Madara, but we thought Madara had already been adopted, and we said, well, isn't she adopted? And she said, no, she's in a foster family, and it's not a good foster family. So now, suddenly, <laughs> we were a lifetime movie of the week. <laughs> so, <laughs> we didn't know what we were going to do about uh, Madara. Um, we, and so I told them, I said, you know what, we're going to work on getting the two of you here, and then we're going to figure out what we'll do about getting Madara here as well. So you might be asking yourself, how did these three amazing girls end up in an orphanage? And I, I'm going to tell you ahead of time that I asked the girls if it was all right with them if I told this part of the story, and they said it was fine. I think partly they want people to understand this is how it is. But it's not because their parents died, and I think as Americans, we've watched a lot of movies, and we have preconceived notions about what that must be all about. But that's not it. Uh, they were taken from the home because their parents were alcoholics, um, and they also uh, just, they were being neglected, and so for their safety, they were taken out of the home. Sadly, this is fairly common in terms of what happens there, and the kids that are in the orphanages, um, about 90%, I'd say, it, at least, that's their story. Not that they, their parents aren't living, but that their parents have neglected them. The parents do have an opportunity to have a certain amount of time to come back and get them. Uh, if they can get their act together and, and show that they're going to straighten out, they can do them, but that rarely, rarely happens. The girls just recently told me that often, 
the parents will come maybe three or four times and bring candy for their kids, but they look around and they go, well, they're okay, and then that's the last they see of them. This is hard to imagine here for us, isn't it? So at the end of our time with them, and if you want to go to the next slide, we have, this is Madara. Yeah. All three of the girls ended up in Salga when they were uh, two for Baiba, four for uh, Agnesa, and six years old for Madara. So we had our task set ahead of us. We sent them home. We went to the airport, sent them home. And sometimes with um, adoptions of teenagers, they kind of speed things along, and it can be as little as four to seven months. So we kind of talked about that maybe being a time frame we'd be looking at would be four to seven months. And now we're still in the very first part of 2010 at this point in January trying to send them home. And um, <clears throat> the problem was that we didn't know exactly when we would see them again. And I'm going to quote a verse for you from the Bible. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And boy, we found that out, because I had it all planned. <laughs> this is how it's going to be, and then we're going to be by the school time, they'll be here, and we'll have them there. That's not how he saw it, though. We had three major obstacles that we had to fight. One was the, the uh, price tag for adoption. For these two was $40,000. And remember, we were worried about 2,600 <laughs> to get to Latvia the first time. Uh, the, the second challenge was how were we going to get Madara here? And the third was that we found out that Agnesa was actually not adoptable. That at that time, there was a uh, US international law. It, it had to do with the Hague Convention, which was an agreement between con certain countries that 16 and 17-year-olds would not be able to be adopted. So there's this big gap there, this big no man's land where there's all these uh, orphans who are not able to be adopted simply because they fall in this weird kind of timeline that they had. And I have two theories about it. One is maybe human trafficking. Maybe there was concern about that. The other is that it simply fell through the cracks when they were putting the Hague uh, Convention together and that somehow they missed that. So that's it. That was our to-do list. $40,000, get the other one here and change international law. <laughs> <laughs> So, now this is the kind of thing you know you can't do by yourself. And so the first thing we had to do was turn, turn where we knew mountains can be moved and tossed right into the sea. And uh, so that's what we did. <clears throat> we, and I'll tell you, everyone, everyone, everyone told us we would not be able to adopt Agnesa. Everyone. <laughs> and um, I kept thinking, yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. I just felt that God was promising that we would be able to officially adopt her. I didn't see bringing her here any other way. So we began working on fundraising first, and it was very slow going until we set up a website and we had the idea to put together an evening of entertainment since we're in theater. We had this great group of talented people who all came and entertained for us, and it was wonderful, and we raised enough money for our first home study. And I'll tell you what, the first of many lessons that I learned in this process was that we needed to put our si uh, aside our pride and ask for help. And David and I were never good at that before this. We always liked to just do our thing. Nobody needs to know. We're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Right, Sheila? <laughs> a friend in the front here is going, yep, yeah, I know. And we had to ask for help. There was no possible way we were going to be able to get that amount of money together without help. And we had said to the girls, we don't have that money, but we have a lot of people, and they love us, and, and we know we can do this. And so I would like to take a moment now <clears throat> to ask you if you helped in any way, whether it was donations, prayers, garage sale items, you came to our garage sale, you thought about us, you, you, uh, you got the word out about the girls, you brought clothes for the girls. Would you just, this is not about boasting, and I'll explain it in a minute, but would you just stand for a minute if you had anything at all whatsoever to do with our adoption or after the girls arrived and helped with that? <clears throat> Look around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am so moved by the fact, and this is just a fraction of the people who helped because there were a whole bunch of other people too who helped us. Uh, it's amazing to me that the power that there is in fellowship, in community, and in love, and that's exactly what happened to bring together the, the funding that we needed to get these girls here. Okay, so we're on our way with funding. Now how do we change the uh, law? So of course you start with Facebook, yeah, <laughs> and emails. <laughs> 
<laughs> what would we do without uh, the technology of today? So I put something on Facebook, oh, we're having this trouble, blah, blah, blah. And pretty soon, one thing leads to another, and, and I, can't even, I don't even know all the connections that happen that we find out after a period of time that someone has already introduced legislation to change that law, and that, that the bill had been uh, proposed two years before, which was great news because it can take about two years for a bill to pass. And so we were thinking, okay, two years, she's 16 now. That makes her 18, that's too old. At 18, there's no possible way to get Agnesette. So we were thrilled to find out that this bill existed, but it, it was lying dormant. And so we and several other uh, families across the country started an email and writing, a letter writing campaign and just got on it. And I know there's people here who probably wrote letters and emails for us too, just so it would get attention again. And uh, so thankfully, um, after we got all of that together, and I, I'm going to stop again and tell you, everyone, everyone said, no, you're not going to get to a doctor. <laughs> that includes lawyers, politicians, clergy, friends, relatives. Everybody said, let's get back to reality. Let's think of other ways we can bring her here. Don't you think we can just bring her on a student visa? How about you wait till she's 18? That one, I'm sorry, but that made me really mad. I was like, no, because 18, it's too long. And plus, as Americans, we think, oh, 18, she'll just come. It's not like that in, in European countries. You don't just decide you're going and go necessarily. But I, I'd smile, yes, that's a great idea. And then I was thinking, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to adopt her. That's it. So, um, so, 11 months later, it took 11 months, uh, the legislation was passed, and at the end of November 2010, President Obama signed it into law, allowing us to adopt Agnesa. Now, we could officially file in order to adopt both girls. So meantime, what about Madara, or, uh, another goal of ours? Well, right after the girls had left, I sent out an email to the uh, support people that we had, the people who helped us go on the mission trip, the um, uh, people who were on the mission trip with us, and explaining the situation with Madara and what was going on with the girls and all of that. And, and not too long after that, I got a response from Paulette Gutwein. Anyone know Paulette? She... <laughs> Paulette and Marv, I barely knew them. We went on the Latvia mission trip together, and I got to know them a little bit, but not a whole lot. And uh, I'll tell you, those two are angels. <laughs> they really are right here on Earth. And Paulette sent me an email, and she said, I've been praying about it, and I really think we're supposed to figure out how to get Madara here. You could have knocked me over with a feather. I couldn't believe that she was willing to do this, not knowing these girls, not knowing Madara, barely knowing us. Uh, but they were willing to start to try to figure out how to get her, her here. So how, here we have the dandelion, and poof, there go the seeds, and now the goop lines are doing this too. So we started working on fundraisers together, and uh, early on, as we were developing our different fundraisers, we discovered that about five minutes from here, maybe ten at the most, there's something called the Latvian Culture Center. Yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Latvian Culture Center. And we've gone over there and connected with the uh, wonderful Latvian people over there. And we had one of our fundraisers in their church and down in their basement. We had hot dogs and pizza. And those Latvians, I tell you, they showed up and paid 50 and $100 for hot dogs. <laughs> They were so wonderful helping us to get the girls here. And that connection for us has been so great because they're able to stay connected with their culture. And every now and then, if there's a Latvian holiday that we don't celebrate here, we all go over there, um, and it's wonderful. In fact, speaking of the dandelions, they, they take those and twist them into wreaths and put them around their heads. There's a certain uh, celebration in the summer where they make these big flower wreaths, and dandelions are one of the flowers they use. So we went there last summer for that celebration. So now, uh, Paulette and Marv were putting together a plan to bring Madara over here, and the hope was to get her here permanently so all three sisters could be here in the United States together. And the plan was for her to come on a visit and then to return a few months later on a student visa. And then the hope was, she figured that, Paulette figured she could probably get Madara here for about six years as a student, and that somewhere in six years, surely, she would meet some nice man, <laughs> and they would get married, yeah, and she could become an American citizen. <laughs> it's a great plan. So, <laughs> so uh, Paulette and I researched and, and visited several schools, and I went along because at that point we still, when we were looking at the schools, we still weren't sure how we would get Agnesi here because the law hadn't been changed yet. But I went, but I didn't 
didn't believe it. And uh, so uh, they got their uh, airline tickets and were all ready to go, and they were going to bring Madara back to spend Christmas of 2010. Now we're a year after the girls were hosted by us. And then three days before their scheduled departure, Paulette called me and she said, you need to call me back right away. And I called her and she said, Julie, Madara is pregnant. Yes. And so our hearts just sank. It's not, of course, because we don't love babies. That's not it. It's that all the plans instantly changed in that instant. And Paulette was brokenhearted because as had happened with us, she and Marv, before ever meeting Madara, had fallen in love with her. And she couldn't see how now to get her here. But she took some time with it and she said, you know what, we're gonna go anyway. So they flew out to Latvia and they picked up Madara. And this is the, on their first visit with her. They found her, they'd never even seen her before, but they, all, they found each other sort of out in the countryside, their car, they got gotten stuck or something, and there's Madara. And uh, she came up and gave them a big hug and they brought her back, and they had a wonderful visit with her. They made sure that she got good prenatal care. Uh, she became a part of their family, and um, she was able to, Paulette was able to reunite the girls. They hadn't seen each other in quite a while. It's difficult to travel in Latvia. They, Madara only lives about probably 30 or 40 minutes away from where the girls lived, but in Latvia, that, that's a lot longer than we think of it being. And so they were able to get together and spend some time together before they flew her back. And then uh, they brought her over to our house and we got to know her and spend time with her. It was a little bittersweet for us because we still hadn't seen our girls in a year and she was a kind of a neat mix between the two of them in terms of her physical appearance and also her personality. Um, and we just, we grew to love her as well. So when Paulette and Marv took Madara back to Latvia, they knew they were taking her back not being sure at all of what was going to happen next. And I just, I love the Gutwines for really letting those seeds just go and say, that's what happened, that's where we are, where, where are those seeds gonna fall and what, what is God gonna do with that? So now, uh, January 2011, Madara went back and we were able to file for both girls because that law had been changed. The hoops you have to jump in order to adopt are unbelievable, and those of you who have done it know, and especially international adoption. I think I've been fingerprinted probably four, three or four times at least. I don't know why they can't just share the fingerprints, but you know, they're the same. Uh, <laughs> I haven't changed them. Yeah. And then you have to get everything notarized, and, and then you have to get, this was a new word for me, I, a new vocabulary word was epistilled. Do you guys know that word? I never heard that word. And what it is, you have to take all those notarized documents and they have to be apostilled, which means that somebody says, I'm a notary who is saying that this person really is a notary. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the stack of papers is just huge. And, uh, and ultimately we were, we were required to make three trips to Latvia. That's part of that huge expense that we talked about. So now we were just waiting for our approval, which would result in getting our travel dates. And as we were waiting, this was a long journey, guys. It's now February 2011, and uh, we'd seen the girls in July of 2009. And I was so discouraged one day just for how long it was taking. And oh, I, you know, it was one of those things so hard, so hard. And I was worrying, uh, which I tend to do occasionally, um, worrying about, okay, so they're coming, how will we afford the everyday expenses for them? Uh, worrying, okay, we still have a lot of money to raise for those three trips, where is that gonna come from? And worrying because we only had one car and how are we gonna get around now and we're, when we're going to be a family of four? And then God gave us three amazing days. On day one, which was a Saturday, our, uh, the Paines, the other Paines, David's brother and uh, his wife Sandy and their daughter Megan called and said, why don't you guys come out to lunch with us? And I thought, oh, that's perfect. I'll just forget how depressed I am and go out to lunch. We'll have a great time. And so we went out. We always have a good time with them. And it was right around Megan's 16th birthday. And so we gave her a gift. And she, oh, she's a very sweet girl. Thank you very much. And then she hands us a box. And we're like, well, it's not our birthday. What? What? And so I open the box, and inside it's filled with cash and checks. Megan had decided that for her 16th birthday, she had 50 children that she invited, children, teenagers, that she invited, sorry about that, uh, that she invited for a skating party. And she said, don't bring a gift for me, bring a donation for my, my aunt and uncle's adoption. 
Yes, and she had raised $800. Wow. Yeah. Well, that perked me right up. <laughs> then, the next day was a Sunday, and my friend Donna, who's here, called me, and she said, you know, my mom has decided that it's time to stop driving. And I think your mom was 90 at the time. Yeah, so it was definitely... <laughs> Definitely time to stop driving. And, uh, <laughs> and she said she's decided to give you her car. <laughs> okay. And she had a minivan. <laughs> How many 90-year-olds have minivans? <laughs> so, yeah. She gave us her minivan. <laughs> And it was in great shape. She took really good care of it. They had a few little little boo boos on the outside where they hit them, but you know. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was wonderful. It was an amazing gift. And then that Monday, the third day, David took our, the car we did have in for service, and it was just a regular checkup, you know, they do. And and they forgot about him. And he sat there most of the morning. And <clears throat> the guy came to him and he said, "Mr. Payne, your car is ready." And he said, "But you have been waiting way too long. This is no excuse for that. So we're not going to." charge you. <laughs> so in three days, I had an answer to all my concerns. Megan had raised money for our adoption that I was worried about. We were given a car, so we had two cars, which I was worried about. And we had a little kind of a wink from God about our everyday <clears throat> expenses. So in March of 2011, we're going along, we're getting there, you know, we're getting excited. I get a call from our adoption agency and they say, well, we wanted to let you know you are approved for Biba, but not for Agnesa. What? What? I couldn't believe it. We had gone through all of that to get that law changed. Agnesa was going to turn 18 in October and now we're in March and time was running out. And I was furious for one thing. And I ran to my computer and I thought, okay, let's go. And I started shooting off emails. All right, everybody, what are we going to do? And then I stopped and I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. God promised me that Agnesa could be adopted. What am I doing spending all this energy? He promised. And I'm going to tell you, ladies, the Bible is full of great promises from God. And he means every one of them. So I thought, all right. I've been promised this. I'm not going to do anything more. I stopped and I prayed a very, very simple prayer, and this was it. I said, Dear God, please make the caseworker change his mind and not even know why. Amen. <laughs> That's it. So, <laughs> two days passed, and I got a call from our adoption agency, and she said, Oh, I've been so anxious to call you. I heard from your caseworker this morning, and he said, I've decided to go ahead and approve the adoption for Agnesa, but I don't know why. <laughs> the only reason they hadn't approved it in the first place, and get this, this will crack you, was because, yes, the law was passed, but they didn't know how to process the paperwork. <laughs> yeah. So they got over it. So. Anyway, we made our first trip to Latvia, our first of three required trips in May of 2011. And while we were there, we stayed in this really great little guest house. And uh, it was just the four of us for two weeks. And the reason for that trip is so that the people who are adopting get to know the culture and uh, the way that the, the girls have lived. It was a really wonderful chance to get to know them better, to understand where they came from. This was our little guest house, what they ate, where they went to school. We were so helpless in Latvia, and they were so in charge <laughs> because they knew the language. Nowhere we, we couldn't read the signs. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't go in the grocery store and know what we were buying. We were completely helpless. There was no dryer. <laughs> yeah, we get so used to our little luxuries. Um, but uh, so we depended on them completely, and it was good for us to know how they were going to feel once they arrived in America, where everything would be different and strange. And there's nothing weirder than being in an, a foreign country and you can't understand what everybody's saying as they're chatting away in Latvian. It's not even close to English, so it, you couldn't even pick up words. And you feel like nobody really gets who you are. It's a very strange feeling. This, I'll stop and tell you, is this wonderful uh, family that Baiba and Agnesa 
Lisa spent a lot of time with when they were in Latvia, almost like a foster family. They, they had them at their house quite a bit, and we fell in love with those people too. But anyway, so we were able to stay in this, uh, in this house together, and um, the other thing is that we were completely dependent on them for giving us directions. David drove. I wasn't about to try driving in a foreign country, and he got his international driver's license, and we're driving on these little narrow streets, which look like alleys to us compared to our big, wide American streets. And Baiba and Agnes at that point still weren't completely sure about the difference between right and left. And so in English, you know, so they'd, they'd say, okay, okay, now turn right. And the other one would go, no left, no right, no left, no right, no left. No left. And David's like, and then finally they'd go, no, straight, straight, straight. So, okay. And Baiba was notorious for saying, okay, slow, 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 slow. Now go, 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 go. <laughs> And there were a couple times <laughs> they'd direct us and we'd be driving and we'd think, this looks an awful lot like a one-way street. <laughs> and we'd say, is this a one-way street? Yes, it is. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's okay, you can just get off of it. That's okay, you can get off. So, yeah. All right, so anyway, we spend our two wonderful weeks with them and then I hear music. Oh, oh no, it's okay. If it's my agent, I'm completely available. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, <laughs> so now we had to leave them again. It was the end of our wonderful two weeks with them, and we knew we'd be back in about two months. We stood on the back stairs of the orphanage and just and just we gave Agnes a hug. She's not a big hugger, but I got one in there anyway, and <laughs> and uh, took Baiba and and held her and just rocked her and. It was tough to leave. It was really tough to leave them again. But Agnes have wisely said two months this time, not two years. And yeah, that's true. So then in August, we came back for our uh, adoption to be official in the eyes of the Latvians. And uh, we, were, we went to court. And um, I'll tell you, it's an odd thing um, when you go to get your children to bring them back. Because as parents, uh, as a adoptive parents. You're excited. It's a different kind of excitement than I ever thought it would be, though. It's a guarded excitement. It's like, yeah, this is exciting, but not like Christmas morning exciting. This is, this is real big responsibility exciting. But for the girls, it was sad. And that was, that was something we had to come to grips with, too. They were leaving everything they'd ever known. They were leaving their country, their culture, their food, their friends, the, the family that they had spent time with. They were leaving all that behind. So for them, this second trip was just a sad time. We had a lot of uh, sad-looking faces during that trip. So we, we did get to see Madara, and her, her baby um, was born by that time, Thomas, just an adorable little boy. And when we went to see him, her, them, um, uh, oh, maybe it was on the first trip, Agnes said, she said, well, you're going to be a grandmother. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. No. That's Paulette. Paulette's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, but uh, Paulette and Marv will be your aunt and uncle. And Agnes said, what a strange family we have. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of that second trip, we brought them back, and they started adapting to, Amer uh, to life in America. And then about a month later, we all four went back for the final trip, which was only to the capital of Latvia, which is Riga, a beautiful, beautiful city. And there, uh, the adoption was made official with the U.S. Embassy. And the minute their feet hit the ground when we got back from that one, they were officially U.S. citizens just two weeks before Agnes's 18th birthday. Yes, we made it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, during this time, I, I remember feeling at one point when somebody was asking me how it was going, I thought, you know what I feel like? I feel swaddled. I felt wrapped up tight. And as hard as everything was, and it was hard, I just felt like God had such a strong hold on me. I felt safe and I felt secure and just swaddled. Uh, there's a quote that I think is after this slide, this Bible with her horses. Um, by uh, Sarah Young, if you've read Jesus Calling, it's a wonderful book, if you haven't, I, I recommend it. I may infuse within you a dream that seems far beyond your reach. You know that in yourself you cannot achieve such a goal. Thus begins your journey of profound reliance on me. It is a faith walk, taken one step at a time, leaning on me as much as you need. 
This is not a path of continual success, but of multiple failures. However, each failure is followed by a growth spurt, nourished by increased reliance on me. Enjoy the blessedness of a victorious life through deepening your dependence on me. Boy, that describes exactly where we had to be. Now, we have the girls here, and I'm not finished talking yet, but at this moment, I would like to introduce to you Agnesa Rose and Biba Rose Payne. Would you please stand? <laughs> Baiba and I have decided to write a book about our experience, and I'm going to write it from the perspective of what we were going through for those two years that it took to get them, and she's going to write it from what was happening with them for the two years. And we'll probably call it the Dandelion Dance if that goes all the way through to the end. <laughs> if you're interested in uh, the possibility of that and, and knowing when that comes out, we'll have a clipboard up here that you can give us your email, and we'll let you know when that hopefully happens. So I bet you want to know what's happened since they got here. Well, that's a whole different, that's a long talk, and it's Itself. But I'm going to give you a real quick Reader's Digest condensed version of that. Um, first of all, they're both attending Lakewood High School. There was a period of time that um, Bible was homeschooled for a while, but she's back there now. She's been doing gymnastics, and she lettered this year in gymnastics. Yeah. <laughs> they both work at Sonic. Not on roller skates, but eventually they keep saying they will. Um, Agnes, so one of her dreams in Latvia was to learn about nail technology, and so we enrolled her in Warren Tech, where she very happily has learned about doing nails. And then she, uh, we were having a discussion about college, and it came out that another dream of hers has always been nursing. And so next year, after she graduates, she's going to go into nursing, and neonatal nursing is what she's going to do. We are now on round two of birthdays and holidays, and round two is more, more for fun than round one was. You know, round one, we were all kind of getting to know each other, but round two, it's like, oh yeah, this is what we do. It's very fun and exciting. Madara came on another visit and spent almost the whole summer with us, bringing Thomas with her. And then the girls went back to Latvia with the goot wines for Madara's wedding. Baiba was watching Miss Congeniality and uh, thought that was a great movie. And she goes, yeah, do they do really, really do that here? And I said, oh, yeah, they do that. And she goes, oh, I think I'd like to do that. And I said, OK. So we Googled and, you know, <laughs> up comes the Miss Universe pageant, the teen division. She throws, she sends her picture in the acceptor. She does the pageant and gets in the top 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which meant, for mom and dad, a $29,000 scholarship. <laughs> yeah, so it was a... It was a <laughs> that was a happy day. And then, uh, but, <laughs> but mostly in this last year and a half that we've had them, finally, um, sometimes I still have to pinch myself and go, they're there. Uh, David and I will hear them down the hall talking in their rooms and we'll go, they're here. Uh, <laughs> but we've been learning to be a family. You have to learn to be a family in this circumstance. These girls were pretty old when we got them, you know? They weren't little babies. And so we've been learning and working together on that. Has it all been easy? No, <laughs> not at all. There's been ups and downs and all arounds. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a movie. Love. Love is something that Agnesa and Baiba are learning to know. We love them unconditionally, but it's been tough for them to, to love us. Although I have to tell you, I got before I came the most sweet card from them and stating that they love me. And that was. <laughs> yeah. It's about pro a process that takes time and building trust. And I. Um, at one point when we were talking about love, we've had a lot of conversations about it recently, Baiba said, the thing is, you have people written on your heart. You have your mother and your dad and your grandparents all written on your heart. She said, I have never had anybody written on my heart. Yeah. So what have I learned about God's character in this process? One, you have to ask. You have to ask him. You have to ask him in prayer. And you have to ask people to help. God's will is not always easy. In fact, this was so hard, if it had anything to do with anyone, anything else but two human beings, we would have given up. I have to tell you, there were lots of times when it felt like, oh, anything but this, we would give up. Time is relative. God's idea of how time passes is very different from ours. Faith is important. Mountains can be moved and tossed into the sea, and many were for us. And yet still, I will struggle with the molehills sometimes. 
Thankfulness in all circumstances, no matter what, to be thankful, it's tough, it's tough to do sometimes. To trust, to be willing to be like those seeds of the dandelion and find out what God has in mind for you. I don't know what's going on with you out there. It might not be adoption for most of you, it probably isn't. I never would have imagined it for me, never. But the fact that those seeds went and they landed and up came the dandelions. Think about what it is for you. Maybe it's a ministry you're thinking of, a mission trip you're considering, a book you want to write. I don't know, but you know what it is. But most of all, of all the lessons, love, love, unconditional love. God gives us his unconditional love, and he says when we accept Christ, uh, we become his adopted children. We made a lot of sacrifices to bring the girls here, and but nothing that we did compares to the sacrifices that God made for us. Would I be willing to nail either one of these girls to a cross? No. No. But he did. And that's what sets him apart from anything else that you can think of. That's real sacrificial love. I must admit that it's been strange to feel so deeply about two people who have trouble returning that sort of feeling to you, but that must be exactly how God feels. All that unconditional love, just there. Come and get it. People turn, walk the other way. I have learned that you don't adopt because you need to be loved. You adopt because you need to love. And God doesn't adopt us because he needs to be loved. He adopts because he is love. Out of the seeds of the dandelion, he can create great beauty. We just have to trust him and let him carry us because he wants to be written on your heart.